Hi, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. I am Jen Hawes. I'm Partnership Manager here at Island Press, and I am so excited to bring you today's conversation on Plastic Soup Solutions, how businesses can end plastic pollution. Um, we have 650 people registered for today's event spanning 49 countries. This is obviously an issue that is affecting people worldwide. And while we won't solve this problem today, I am confident that our esteemed panel of experts can help create a meaningful conversation on the role that businesses play in mitigating our plastic pollution problem. This webinar is brought to you in partnership with Island Press and Green America. We're so pleased that Break Free from Plastic and Bees Wrap have also joined us today. Um, so Green America's mission is to harness economic power, the strength of consumers, investors, businesses, and the marketplace to create a socially just and environmentally sustainable society. Green America's Green Business Network is the first nationwide network of businesses dedicated to socially and environmentally responsible business practices. If you're a business, join the network at greenbusinessnetwork.org, and if you're an individual, join at greenamerica.org. Island Press is an environmental nonprofit book publisher. Founded in 1984, Island Press's mission is to provide the best ideas and information to those who seek to understand and protect the environment and create solutions to complex problems. Island Press elevates voices of change, shines a spotlight on crucial issues, and focuses attention on sustainable solutions, like we're doing today with this free webinar. Um, I'd like to share two other webinars with you all that we are in no way affiliated with, but relate to the topic at hand. They're from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. On October 29th, NOAA is hosting a webinar on improving microplastic research with Dr. Judith Weiss. Last week, NOAA hosted an excellent webinar on human consumption of microplastics. The registration links and past webinar slides are going to be included in this slide deck, which we'll be emailing out after the conversation, and they're in your handout section of the GoToWebinar platform. Uh, today, we're featuring the book Plastic Soup Atlas as part of the webinar, and we invite you to get your copy of the book today if you'd like um, using coupon code webinar at islandpress.org slash book slash plastic dash soup. Um, and before we get started, I want to point out a few technical um, elements of the GoToWebinar platform for you. First, uh, we are happy to have a very robust conversation with you, as, and we would love you to put your questions into the questions box on the side panel of the GoToWebinar. Um, if you have trouble with the technology, you can use the chat function and chat with me, and I'd be happy to help you with things there. Uh, when the webinar concludes, you'll be asked to fill out a brief survey. We highly recommend your participation and your answers as this will help to fund more of these free educational resources. And when the webinar concludes in the next day or so, you'll be receiving a, a copy of the recording. You are encouraged to share this educational resource far and wide, put it on social media, um, put it in your newsletter groups, wherever is appropriate for you. Um, now I'd like to introduce our participants. So today we have Shilpi Shotre is moderating. She is responsible for the development and implementation of communication strategies that advance the goals of Break Free from Plastic, the global movement working to stop plastic pollution for good. She brings over a decade experience in ocean advocacy and com conservation policy, including coalition building around the plastic waste prevention. Her writing has been published in The Economist, Yes Magazine, the Stanford Journal of Law, Science and Policy, Huffington Post, and the National Geographic Ocean Views. Shilpi is also the founder of Sham Shamudre Skin and Sea, a plant-based skincare line featuring wild harvested local seafood. By using clean ingredients, zero plastic, zero waste, pla sorry, zero waste packaging, and brand activism, their goal is to incentivize everyday consumers to be better stewards of our blue planet. Michelle Roskamp Abing is a political scientist who has been active in the battle against plastic soup since 2001 with the Plastic Soup Foundation, one of the leading international groups fighting plastic pollution. He reports on scientific findings and current developments online at plasticsoupfoundation.org and lectures about plastic soup in the Netherlands and around the world. And he is the author of Plastic Soup. And Sarah Kack. 
founded Bees Wrap in 2012, searching for an alternative to disposable plastics in her own kitchen and pulling for her lifetime long lifetime love of textiles and art. She infused organic cotton with beeswax, organic jojoba oil, and tree resin. The resulting reusable wraps provide a versatile way to store food as beautiful as they are sustainable. In the seven years since founding Bees Wrap, Sarah has grown the business to more than 40 employees, a global presence, and I love her products. All right, and with that, I will hand it over to Shilpi. Hi everyone, it's so great to be here. Jen, thanks for the introduction. Um, I want to just give a really brief introduction to Break Free from Plastic for those of you that might not be familiar with the movement. Um, so Break Free from Plastic is a global movement. We involve around 1,500 groups working all over the world at all points in the plastic pollution life cycle. So we don't consider plastic to be pollution once it hits the environment or the ocean, but we consider plastic to be pollution the second it's produced. So we're looking at the entire life cycle of plastics from extraction to production, to consumption, to disposal. Our groups are campaigning for systemic change worldwide with an emphasis in the US, Europe, um, in the Asia Pacific regions of the world. We also have growing membership in Latin America and Africa. Uh, we take corporate accountability very seriously. And one of the ways we do this is by identifying where there are greenwashing attempts and really trying to shift the narrative on individuals are to blame for plastic pollution issues, um, but really turning, turning that narrative on its head and looking upstream at who's creating this mess in the first place. And one of the ways we do this is the Break Free from Plastic brand audit. Um, the first ever brand audit was pioneered last year, and we have scaled this about four times this year. And brand audits are essentially taking coastal cleanup a step further. So for us, you know, it's not enough to look at the plastic waste that's found in the waste stream, but also look at the brands behind that waste to begin with. And so we call this the brand audit. And we had about uh, 800 groups from 84 countries participate in our recent brand audit that took place on World Cleanup Day, um, which was Saturday the 21st, so just, just last weekend. You can learn more about the movement by visiting um, our website, breakfreefromplastic.org, and we are pretty active on social media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, uh, probably most uh, active on is Instagram, and please do use our hashtag, um, breakfreefromplastic. So without further ado, I'd like to um, hand it over to our first speaker, Michelle, who can talk more about his book and what he's been up to. Thank you. <clears throat> um, thank you so much for inviting me for this uh, speaking to this uh, webinar. I'm the author of Plastic Soup, an Atlas of Ocean Pollution. And um, now it's not clicking. What is happening? Ah. Sorry. Um, um, the Plastic Soup edition of Island Press is not the only one. Uh, there's a Dutch edition, there's an Italian edition, there will be within a few weeks a Japanese edition. Apparently people from all over the world are keen or interested to learn more about uh, plastic soup pollution and the crisis about that. Um, the, and also about to learn more about solutions. Now the book is offering both aspects. There are in fact two um, um, 
sec segments. And uh, one is called on the map and the other is off the map. On the map is about the causes and the consequences of plastic pollution to the environment, to the human health. And off the map is about uh, how to solve the mess. Um, <clears throat> I'm happy to give you a short presentation using some of the illustrations uh, that you will find in the book. So this is the first one. You see three American girls and they are lying uh, amidst the waste they generated within one week. And what you see, it's, it's all a single use items of packaging. And the picture shows, in fact, how much waste we are all generating all the time. The next uh, one is a little boy from Manila, the Philippines. And obviously, um, there is no waste infrastructure in place. So the people living in these houses just jump their waste and it's washed ashore. The little boy is collecting uh, pet uh, bottles because they have a little value for recycling, but the other plastics are just lying there. It's not um, worth anything anymore. Um, the book is, uh, shows that uh, plastic soup is manifesting itself in many different ways. So here you have the coast of South Africa. What you see is after heavy rainfall, rivers are exporting uh, plastic bottles to the sea and then they come uh, ashore. And these are all uh, bottles with a cap on, uh, other plastics you don't see. Another example is uh, birds are uh, nesting and using uh, nylon uh, ropes from fishery, but they hang themselves because they are not uh, aware of the danger that uh, this is opposing. Um, you are all familiar with the um, phenomenon that macroplastic will get into microplastics and it is impossible to remove that from our environment anymore. And we humans also create products with, which has microplastics in it that are intentionally added to it. And these are all uh, coming into our water systems after using these uh, products in the bathroom. One thing you should know or keep in mind that plastic soup is not only about ocean pollution. It is also about plastic soup on land. So scientists argue that it is even worse on land than uh, at the ocean. So the first section of the book, some key message is plastic soup is everywhere, everywhere where you look. It manifests itself in many different ways, many different locations. It is a threat to animals, to ecosystems, to human health. And we are not able to clean it up. So what should we do? What should we do to get a solution of it? The first thing is we should recognize that using all this amount of plastic will not, will, um, that it is impossible to keep it out of the environment. And the main reason is single-use uh, plastic. Supermarkets are full of it. You all know, uh, you are all aware of that. And in developing countries, you find the mini uh, packaging, uh, a lot of packaging uh, relative to a very low amount of product. You talk about shampoo or coffee or beans or whatever. And uh, multi-layer um, plastics, not, we are not able to recycle it. It has no value and you find it all over the place. Uh, single use plastics is about 40% of uh, our uh, plastic production. And uh, plastic is made of uh, pellets, uh, the material to make plastic from. And you also find everywhere the plastic pellets or noodles uh, because industry is spilling it in by millions. Um, because in the 
in the past few years, it has become very clear that plastic is causing a global disaster. And business, mainstream business, feels, of course, the pressure to do something about it. And uh, multinationals have proposed several uh, measures, like they use less wage per package, or they uh, use only recyclable packaging, or they increase the content of recycled content in packaging. And if you analyze these uh, so-called solutions, then you will find out that they allow, in fact, for unlimited growth, um, uh, for more and more production and use of plastic. So they are not a solution, not a real solution for plastic soup. Also, you have initiatives of uh, companies that use ocean plastic to make products from. While on the one hand, this is very good to raise awareness. On the other hand, it is no solution for plastic soup. You cannot solve plastic soup by making more plastic products. What really is needed is the following. We need an absolute reduction of single-use plastic. We need investments in logistics of refill systems. We need implementation of extended producer's responsibility. Businesses must become responsible for the waste of their products. We must ban specific items. We must tax plastic, uh, especially virgin plastic, to make it more expensive. We must implement deposit schemes. These kind of things will help. Because if we do not, for instance, ban plastic bags, we will be confronted with pictures like this. This is the content of a stomach of a camel. After eating plastic bags, he died. And this is a lump of 52 kilograms. You don't believe it, but it is the fact. And we also need to start um, out of the box thinking. And a very good example, I think, is natural bending. Then you, you use a technique of laser beams that print information in the skin of a fruit or vegetable, um, avoiding, of course, the use of packaging. We also need to add value to plastic. If you add value to plastic, people have a financial incentive. They bring back their containers properly, and otherwise they don't and uh, part of it becomes uh, rubbish in the environment. Um, we, we know now, by now, plastic soup is a wicked problem. There's no silver bullet. It means that we need, we need behavior change. We need governments to be involved, but we need also business. business with all kinds of solutions to prevent leakages to the environment, to prevent use of plastic, to invent other alternatives. And we must also support for this in terms of R&D, uh, research development or other things, regulation. To end with just one example, um, we can develop filters for washing machines. If you have one wash load of five kilograms of synthetic garments, you release millions of synthetic fibers into our waterways, into the system. It can be prevented if we invest in the right way and do the right thing. So I like to end with the message of the section of, of the map of the book. Very clearly, we cannot recycle our way out. Educating people is very important, but not enough. We do need national and global re regulation as soon as possible. Last but not least, we cannot fight the plastic soup without real business solutions. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Michelle.
Um, you know, I think there's a couple points that really stuck with me from Michelle's presentation is that we cannot clean our way out of this mess, out of the plastic soup, and that source reduction is key. So we need to be looking upstream for better solutions and businesses play a huge role in that. Um, so I think this is a perfect segue into Sarah's presentation as a business owner and innovator in the space. So Sarah, please feel free to kick us, kick us off. Hey, um, my, hi, my name is uh, Sarah Keck. I'm the founder of BeesRap. Uh, BeesRap's mission is um, to inspire uh, planet positive habits um, in our everyday um, rituals. Um, it, it, we encourage our customers to make um, choices and, and their day-to-day -day habits um, to challenge single-use plastic consumption um, and push back on, on the norm, which is to use plastics in the kitchen um, on a daily basis and, and find alternatives. Um, these wrap is really reshaping the way that people think about their food storage. Um, it's pushing them to rethink uh, what we are doing on a, on a daily basis, um, at, um, requiring them to um, look at their habits um, with open eyes. And uh, our consumers are making choices, a lifestyle pledge to, um, to make a change by, um, by choosing to use these wraps. All the small step that they're taking is truly a small step, um, but it is part of the larger movement. And that is something that is hard to remember, but very important in giving us hope, um, as we've just seen what a huge problem plastic pollution truly is. One second. Okay. There we go. Um, Beast Wrap was founded in 2012, seven years ago, um, by myself. Uh, it started in my home, and uh, we quickly grew out of that space um, into two different spaces until um, our most current space in Middlebury. Uh, we employ 40 people. Um, and we produce all of the bees wrap here in our facility and distribute from here as well. Um, we're really a team of people who are curious about ways that we can change our habits and educate um, those around us and how to make better choices. Uh, right now, bees wrap is sold in over 3,000 stores um, around the world and online retailers and in 41 countries. Um, our customers really, they transcend all demographics and geographies, which is something that um, is inspiring for me as the founder of this company and the work that uh, we do here every day. Um, some of our customers are taking a hard look at the impact that they have on, their, on the environment and every step that they take, and other customers of ours are um, looking to take the first step. Um, but what they are all doing is looking to find a simple, affordable, reusable plastic solution. Um, they are all paying attention to the ingredients and materials that we use without compromise. And we hear about that on a daily basis. Um, and they're looking to embrace brands like these wraps. Um, they share similar, similar um, values to ours in um, how we care for our employees, how we interact with our communities, both local and global, and um, our manufacturing practices. So what is Bees Wrap? Um, for those of you that are not familiar with it, it is a natural alternative to plastic wrap. Uh, you can use it to cover a bowl, wrap cheese, wrap half of a vegetable or fruit, like an avocado or a lemon. It's great for wrapping bread. It's great for uh, wrapping a sandwich. It is made from organic cotton that is infused with beeswax, tree resin, and organic jojoba oil. Um, it comes in a variety of sizes. 
It is washable, wash in cool water. Uh, you can use a little dish soap if you need it, hang to dry and use again. It lasts for about a year using a few times a week, often more. I know mine lasts longer than that and we hear that from customers uh, frequently that it lasts up to two years often. Uh, and then at the end of its life, it can be cut up and put in a compost or it makes a excellent fire starter. Uh, what we work to do here at Bees Wrap, and this has uh, been an evolution from the beginning of the business until today, which is an inspiring one. Um, as when we first started, very few people um, were looking for an alternative that we interacted with. We're looking for alternatives for plastic wrap, and, and they needed to be educated on what Bees Wrap was, um, what it meant to use a reusable um, wrap like this, how to care for it, and, and what that impact of um, using plastic really um, meant on the environment and how easy it was to change. Um, and we do this through um, the outreach and our social media, community engagement, and the storytelling that we do here. Um, we, partnered, we partnered with the National Geographic and 1% for the Planet to increase that outreach. Um, we've created videos um, to show the use and care of bees wrap. And we also have a term that we use here, which is our collective how. And that's uh, how we as a community, both within the walls of bees wrap and the greater community, um, how we work together to um, counteract the uh, plastic pollution that we're seeing everywhere. Um, the consideration for the environment is something that has been part of the company since day one. Um, it, is a, it is considered in everything that we do at Bees Wrap, but it has also been an evolution and it continues to be an evolution. We're learning every day um, new ways that we can, um, that we can do better in the company in terms of our plastic waste here as a company, our manufacturing practices, what we offer the customer, and how we engage with um, our customers. Um, and remembering that I think is important um, for our work here, but also as individuals. Um, we have a term we like to use, which is the imperfect environmentalist. And I think that um, term um, uh, helps people to put their foot through the door for the first time um, in taking steps to um, reduce their plastic um, consumption as it can be incredibly overwhelming. And none of us are perfect, perfect in this as it is such a large task to take on. Uh, I'd like to go through a few of the things that we consider here at Bees Wrap. Um, our sourcing, we use GOTS certified organic cotton. That is the global organic textile standard. Uh, we source our beeswax from sustainably managed beehives. Um, and, and I won't go into the details of that, but just give you a couple of um, things that we look for, which are um, not using pesticides and herbicides in the hives, um, not sourcing our wax from bees that travel long distances for year-round um, uh, pollination. Uh, we use responsibly sourced tree resin and organic jojoba oil. Um, our packaging is 100% post-consumer recycled paper. Uh, we have a cellulose-based film that is uh, biodegradable to allow the consumer to look inside the package. Uh, we partnership with Five Gyres through 1% for the Planet. Five Gyres works on plastic pollution awareness and solutions. And we also partnered with National Geographic on their plastic awareness campaign. Um, they started about a year and a half ago by offering um, an alternative to plastic wrap for their consumers and readers. Um, we also feel strongly here at Bees Wrap uh, that uh, giving back to our community is an integral part of being a part of the community. Um, we support the Bee Cause, which installs um, observation hives in classrooms and libraries around the country and provides a curriculum on sustainable beekeeping. Uh, we also work to support our local community 
um, schools and organizations um, supporting those in need as well as local environmental issues. And we also uh, give paid time off to our employees to um, join in causes that are important to us, such as the climate strike that happened last week. Um, and then lastly, which I think is the most important piece on this list as it ties it all together is transparency. And we have relied heavily on um, two certifications, our B Corp certification and our Green America certification. Um, and both of these have given us tools to assess our company and to look deeper into all aspects of how we um, impact um, the, the choices that we make, the business choices that we make impact the environment. Um, for B Corp, uh, they take a close look at our mission um, to see that we are consistently incorporating environmental impact into our decision making. They also um, look to see that we are committed to a specific positive environmental impact. And um, they, as well, um, make sure that we are making a legal commitment to ensure that the environmental performance of the business uh, would remain part of the decision-making um, process of the company over time, um, no matter the ownership of the company. They also look at how we source suppliers um, and the environmental impact of our suppliers. They look at our products to see that um, they are just, whether they're designed to restore or preserve the environment and um, designed to, or if they're designed to um, solve an environmental issue. Um, and they also look to see how we manage our waste production. Um, we are very proud of our B Corp certification. We were uh, just ranked on the B Corp Best for the World Environmentalist, um, which uh, considered environmental performance in our facility, our materials, our emissions, our resource, and our energy use. Um, and then the other certification that is important to us is our Green America um, certification, which also um, looks to certify companies that are environmentally responsible in the way they run their operations and facilities. Um, and how they source their raw materials, manufacture products, and in addition, how they market them. Uh, so I wanted to give one example of how these um, certifications um, trickled through the company. Um, we have recently put together a green team, which has members from all departments of the company. And they are looking right now, um, doing a deep dive into our waste and doing a waste and plastic audit, which will um, conclude at the end of December. And they will provide the company steps in all departments, all aspects of the company, and how we can reduce that um, waste and make better, better uh, business decisions. Uh, and that is what I have for right now. I am um, happy to answer questions. Awesome, thank you so much, Sarah. That was really wonderful. Um, so we have a little less than a half an hour for questions, so I wanna get started right away so we can tackle as many of your questions as possible. Um, so the first one is, recyclable plastics are making a mess of composting businesses and not breaking down in closed compost piles. What can be done to correct this problem? So Michelle or Sarah, if either of you have an answer to this, feel free to jump in. Michelle, I'll let you take this one. I think you're more experienced on, on, on this one. So, uh, please, can you repeat the question? Sure, so the question is, recyclable plastics are making a mess in composting businesses and not breaking down in closed compost piles. What can be done to correct this problem? It's, um, 
it's really a problem because also the bioplastics is um, uh, polluting uh, the organic materials and vice versa the um, um, normal plastics is uh, in, um, in in the waste bin uh, it's very difficult to 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 solve this problem because it is has to do with the attitude of people and the people are not as tidy as they should be. Um, so one could think about um, uh, selective the, separating the, the, the fractions um, upstream or downstream, I would say, the, at the uh, recycling plant, but still there's a lot of uh, difficulties uh, there. So I don't really don't know what the good solution uh, would be. Uh, too many problems with recycling. Agreed. And, and just to remind folks, you know, only 9% of our plastic has been recycled since the 1950s. So good to keep in mind. Um, Sarah, this is for you. How do you balance the need for business growth and national and international distribution slash expansion with the need to reduce your plastic and other single use materials? So really getting at how do you reduce your packaging impact and footprint as you're expanding? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is, that is a challenge because um, part, of the, uh, part of the solution is reducing consumption. Um, but also finding alternative ways for finding solutions to replace what we use already and what we need, the needs that we have. Um, these drop is, um, we, we try, we work hard to keep our packaging as minimal as possible um, and to keep it as light as possible to reduce the um, imprint of our shipping on the environment and um, and also to encourage reuse um, and educating our customers on all of these things. Um, it is something that we, we've taken one step um, just this past year and um, um, cutting down our line of products to include more wraps in a package. Um, we no longer offer, offer our single small wrap or our small sets, um, which is something that, um, that reduces that um, shipping and the traveling of small pieces. But um, it, like I said it, uh, earlier when I was speaking, the evolution of finding solutions as we go is something that we're always talking about. Um, and I think that's a, an important part of the process. Thanks. And a, a quick follow-up question for you, Sarah. Um, at end of life, can these wraps be composted? I believe you said yes, but that, that was a follow-up question. Um, and also, can it be used for wrapping meat? Um, we do not recommend wrapping it for raw meat um, because you cannot use hot water to wash it um, and sterilize it. Uh, so we do recommend wrapping it for cooked meat or covering a bowl or a dish or a plate with the bees up to be on the safer side um, or in a sandwich. Thank you. Um, this is a question for both of you. Um, how effective are letter writing campaigns? Any tips on how to get businesses to listen to citizen concerns? So Sarah, you could answer this as a business owner and Michelle as an author and activist. <laughs> I have no idea how effective these campaigns can be. I think it's always some effect, uh, but you never know. And a letter, um, uh, sending letters is maybe uh, not uh, the most environmental friendly way to campaign. Um, I would say that um, reaching out to legislators is always is something that we hear consistently as important that they want to hear from um, businesses and they they um, especially here in Vermont um, they want to create a place that businesses feel is um, friendly to them um, and so that goes both ways. 
Um, as far as reach consumers reaching out to businesses, I would say that that is probably um, an it's an amazing way to communicate. We want to hear from our customers always. Um, I can say um, pretty confidently that our Monday meetings are there is always a comment from a customer that comes to the table. And those demands um, that they put on us are heard and responded to. Great, thank you. Michelle, this is a question for you. What do you think of all the silicone packaging products showing up in the market? What kind of packaging? Silicone? I have no idea. Sarah, do you have an opinion on that? Uh, well, um, what I would say is that um, silicone is an is an alternative to plastic. It is not. Um, I'm actually not sure how biodegradable it is, um, and the longevity of, of how long it takes to biodegrade. Um, one thing that these wraps. Um, and I and I would like to see other products like these wrap that is completely 100% biodegradable, made of natural ingredients. Um, that is a solution that doesn't have consequences that are partway there or halfway there. It's fully there. Um, so while silicone has its um, ad some advantages, um, I would say that it still has um, a fairly strong impact on the environment. The, the problem is, of course, there's no uh, uh, international standards uh, for biodegradability on uh, bioplastics or whatever. And uh, maybe there should be first and uh, standards uh, be applied. Yeah, thank you both for your thoughts. Uh, Sarah, I think this question might be better, best suited for you, but Michelle, feel free to jump in. Um, what would you recommend are the best materials for takeout containers um, at restaurants to use for food? So takeaway. Um, that, that is a challenging one. Um, the bees wrap makes a great um, alternative for sandwiches, for, but for muffins or bagels. Um, the, the biggest challenge there is remembering to bring it with you. Um, to-go containers are great. Stainless steel um, is great to take with you. Um, but then the, the next um, alternative would be um, the cardboard containers that can be broken down. I, I would say uh, bring your own container. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Um, so I know we touched on this a little bit on legislation, and this is a great question around, so would it make sense to propose state level legislation to provide subsidies to plastics manufacturers to convert product lines, especially food packaging, to renewable feedstocks like PLA? So it's, it's a bit technical. Um, let me know if you want me to repeat that one. We do not consider uh, uh, PLA as a good alternative for plastics. In the environment, they act uh, like um, uh, common plastics or oil-based plastics. So I don't think that's a good idea. I would agree with Michelle on that. Awesome, there's so many questions. Let me get the next one. Um, Sarah, a follow-up question for you. You mentioned composting. Is, are your bees wraps for commercial composting or will it break down in residential composting? It will break down in a residential compost. Awesome. And this can be for either of you. What are some promising examples of refill systems? I think Michelle, you touched on that in your presentation. Refill systems? Refill systems. Yeah, well, what I mentioned, uh, bring your own. Hey, you have to bring your own basket and uh, you, you, it, it, it will be filled in the shop. Um, there are numbers of uh, numerous uh, refill systems, but the thing is, it should be um, infested as a real uh, systematic uh, way um, um, for a whole chain of uh, shops of the same company or whatever. It, 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 
it should be scalable and uh, effective. And it is only uh, possible if major um, multinationals will, uh, will invest in it. Otherwise, it will be local initiatives and that will not be the solution uh, after all. So we have to get the, the beverage uh, companies, the food companies, uh, they all should um, um, play their part. Sarah, it looks like you've got something to say. Well, I, I would piggyback on that, that it comes um, from the consumer's demand as well and um, changing what we want um, uh, and, and then demanding that of our stores, um, but changing our habits. So um, it takes us to bring our reusable containers and our refillable um, glass bottles for drinks and um, going to the stores and saying, you know, this is what I want, making use of the refillable um, containers at our, you know, natural food stores and our larger grocery stores that have them um, and continuing to be vocal about it. But there's only a very small percentage of the consumers that will change their behavior. Uh, the other ones uh, will uh, um, profit from the convenience of plastic. They won't change their behavior. So I think it should be also presented by the companies. Huh? You don't have a yeah, choice I... and uh, then they, uh, then it might be mm -hmm. a shift. I agree. Yep, I agree it comes from both sides. Yeah, when we started Beeswrap, it was, um, we we really had to educate people on what it meant to bring your Beeswrap somewhere and wrap up your carrots or wrap up the end of the, we had to tell people that you didn't have to use please, uh, plastic wrap. And that education, um, to see it working over these past seven years is just really um, gives me a lot of hope. It's all about habits. Eh? If you are, it's in your system, mm -hmm. then you use it. And otherwise, uh, you have mm -hmm. to be educated to do so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. So this is a question for you, Sarah, in comment. Um, I love bees wrap, but also wonder about pressure on bees, the colonies, the use of bees, etc. How is this sourced, and is there really room to scale up the use of beeswax? Um, could you imagine theoretically the capacity to replace a good percentage of plastic wrap? Mm -hmm. Well, there are, um, but there, are, I guess there are two parts to that question. I'll start with the bees first. Um, uh, beeswax is a renewable resource. Um, and the way that we source our beeswax does not do any harm to the bees. Um, it's a byproduct of honey production for beekeepers. And um, as I touched on before, we have um, guidelines for our sourcing um, that um, allow us to support beekeepers um, that are practicing sustainable beekeeping. Um, as far as is there enough beeswax, um, I don't know that there's enough bee I don't know the answer to that. Um, beeswax has been a part of the products that we use for a very long time. When you think about lip balms and creams and um, candles, um, there it's integrated into so many products that we use today that we don't necessarily think about. Um, but there are also plant-based waxes too um, that can be used um, as an alternative or in addition to. Thanks, Sarah. That's great. Um, Michelle, this is for you. What are your thoughts on green chemistry? For instance, utilizing perennial feedstocks instead of oil to create renewable bioplastic products. So I know you've, you've already touched on this a little bit, um, but are there, are there specific potential downsides that you can name? I'm not sure if I understand the question well. <clears throat> I can repeat. I can repeat the question and let me know if Please. this is helpful. So, what are your thoughts on green chemistry? 
for instance, on utilizing perennial feedstocks instead of oil to create renewable bioplastic products? Yeah, I, I don't think uh, it will be the solution in the end, but uh, maybe research will come up with very uh, uh, interesting uh, ideas. The problem uh, with all this is that it might give an excuse to uh, companies to just uh, continue their production of uh, plastic or alternative plastics. Um, this is another good question kind of around, around the uh, using other natural ingredients, but you know what is worse using single use plastics or using water to wash your reusable plastics as water is also a precious commodity. Yeah, you, you have to compare all, all the uh, environmental effects in uh, life uh, uh, cycle assessments. Uh, normally plastic pollution is not included. So people only look at energy use or, plas or water use, but you should you should include somehow uh, plastic soup, plastic pollution uh, in the environmental effects and then come up with an, uh, what is better or not. But if okay. it, it's very difficult to compare. Right, and it comes uh, back to the um, saying that we use here of the imperfect environmentalist and the choices that we make um, every day. And, um, they're what we have to do them. We have to make these choices at, um, from a point of education um, and individually, uh, which feels overwhelming at times. Michelle, I'm wondering. Um, there's a couple questions around incineration, and this one is specifically asking: Is clean incineration possible? Uh, it, it depends. The, there are a very advanced uh, in this generation uh, systems, but they are they do also have a catch. They uh, should be fed with uh, loads of uh, plastics, and then you it's an incentive to use uh, a lot of plastics in order to keep these uh, factories running. But in a lot of places in the world, incineration is very uh, uh, bad uh, for health reasons or whatever. Right, and like you said, it does nothing about source reduction now. No. Um, okay, um, I've gotten through many of your questions. We've got around eight minutes remaining. Um, so we have time for a few more here. So we've got, uh, one just came in here. Most of the debris shown in pictures from many parts of the world during Michelle's presentation are made of plastic. Uh, as aluminum cans have better recycling rates than plastic bottles, of course costs are involved, is it possible and practical to just use cans instead of bottles uh, for water and other beverages? Are metal cans uh, meant? Aluminum, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know what is better. Um... Uh, that they are uh, uh, better recyclable because they are metals. Um, so in that way, uh, it is, it's easily to get it out of the, the waste stream and to to recycle uh, it. In that way, I think uh, cans are better. But in Holland, uh, for instance, there's a discussion uh, whether or not to have a deposit um, or um, um, a deposit scheme for uh, cans and uh, we think there should be because cans are more uh, in the environment than the plastic bottles. Sarah, do you have any thoughts on that? Like cans versus single use plastic bottles or other, you know, um, higher value items? Um, well, I do, uh, I think that it doesn't, um, it comes back to the consumption again and it doesn't reduce consumption. Um, using things that come in a more natural form, dry beans, um, drinks from taps, um, those solutions are more sustainable than um, looking for these interim alternatives. Great. Um, this is a good question. So, and it's a hard one, right? Uh, what can we do with all the massive amounts of plastic already in the environment once we collect them? 
you can both answer that. It, 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 whatever you can get out of the environment is is uh, you should get it out eh, by cleanups or whatever. But um, it's impossible to get it all out. So what you really have to do is to go uh, upstream or at source uh, for solutions. Less plastic and systems that uh, prevent uh, plastic to, to end up in the environment. Um, focusing on cleanups is not uh, the best way to fight the plastic soup. Yeah, and I would say that cleanups help in the awareness of the problem. Um, but yes, we're we're not going to collect all of the plastic and turn it into something else. Um, but as uh, Michelle said, it is uh, awareness. It um, is really an important piece of this the solution equation. Um, and looking through. Um, his book, Plastic Soup, he's got some great um, images in there in the back of um, things that our people are um, doing with plastic pollution to create awareness. Yep. Thank you both. Um, Sarah, this is a, a question for you. What is a good alternative to bubble wrap? Um, this person has had a, uh, I have had a, a business that ships large wooden products and it is difficult to find a packaging solution that is lightweight and eco-friendly. Obviously very different from these wraps, but it would be good to get your take. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I, I am not an expert on um, alternative packaging solutions for things other than these wraps, which is light, thankfully, and easy to ship. Um, but uh, that, that is a challenge. Um, I know that there is some um, of the compostable, um, corn-based foam things. I don't know what they're called, I'm sorry. Um, uh, and actually, I don't know that I have a good answer for that. That is not my area of expertise. Maybe you know something, Michelle. <laughs> no. <laughs> all right, all, we have three minutes and I, I will stop the questions there because I wanna give Sarah and Michelle um, a minute or so each to share any last final thoughts before we close. So Michelle, why don't we start with you? Well, uh, <clears throat> thank you. I think um, it's a great opportunity to share some thought um, uh, with all the um, people that uh, attend. Um, the problem with plastic soup is um, 20 years ago, nobody knew the problem. and um, it's uh, accumulating, it's getting worse, and uh, the next generation will uh, have uh, all the negative impacts of uh, plastic, while my generation benefited mostly from uh, plastic. And um, So it's a huge challenge for the next generations uh, to deal with plastics and um, take my word, it will not get off the political agenda in the coming decades. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I would like to encourage everyone to support companies that um, have transparency into their manufacturing practices, their sourcing, and, um, and the ingredients in their products. Um, there are avenues to do this, as I mentioned, the two certifications, um, and then um, from the audit that you spoke of in your break free from plastic earlier, that's um, new to me and I'm, I'm anxious to look forward to look into that. Um, but there, there, this is a way that um, us as individuals can have uh, a voice and making change uh, in our, um, in the company that makes, uh, make so many demands on our environment. Thank you both. It was awesome to host the, uh, sorry, moderate this this webinar. You you were both so inspiring. And you know, at Break Free From Plastic, we're really working on shifting the narrative that individuals are to blame for plastic pollution and really focus on better corporate and government accountability. So you're both serving the space so well um, and really appreciate everyone for attending. 
Uh, Jen, did you want to say any closing thoughts before we hop off? Yes, thank you so much, everyone. That was a wonderful conversation. I really appreciate your time. Um, we wanted to make sure we thanked um, Green America. Um, we uh, have a slide and it's not changing right now, but if you're interested in joining um, as an individual because you're concerned about this, go to greenamerica.org, or if you're a business, um, go to uh, Green America um, Business Network um, and learn more there. Um, and um, if you'd like to pick up a copy of the book, again, we encourage that. Um, we're giving 20% off with the coupon code webinar uh, for Plastic Soup, and it's islandpress.org slash book uh, slash plastic dash soup. So thank you all so much. We'll have a recording out to you soon, and we really appreciate your time um, as panelists and as, as attendees. So have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, all. Bye.